So it's 9 a.m. West Coast time and 6 p.m. Central European time. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to open today's uh, Global Immune Talks. My name is Dietmar Zehn, and I have the honor of introducing our fantastic uh, today's speaker, Professor Marcello Hill. Um, Marcello uh, started as a medical doctor his career in Uruguay. He is originally from Uruguay. He completed his doctor degree training in 2002 at the same time, which is very spectacular. He obtained a magister, which I guess is similar to a master degree also in biochemistry. Thereafter, he moved to France to the University of Nantes, and uh, there he first did his PhD for four years, and he also then did, uh, together with the INSEM Institute, also known postdoctoral training that lasts until 2010. Afterwards, he went back to Uruguay, became an associate professor at the Immunobiology Department Faculty of Medicine of the University of the Republic of Uruguay. He was for a while also a professor still in Nantes. Uh, since 2013, he's head of the Laboratory of Immunoregulation and inflammation, which is affiliated with the Pasteur Institute in Uruguay. And uh, he also has experience in the industry sector. So he is founder and chief scientific officer of a company called Arden. And since 2017, he is director of the Center for Transplantation Immunology. And he has won numerous prizes, including a science grant from the European Society for uh, Organ Transplantation. He has done an outstanding uh, amount of really key and significant scientific contributions. He has worked on a relatively broad topic that all has to do with inflammation and immune regulation. It included work on the NLRP3 inflammasome, immune regulatory enzymes, tolerogenic dendritic cells, regulatory macrophages, mesenchymal stem cells, myeloid derived suppressor cells, regulatory T cells, and finally, pro-inflammatory ion channels, which I assume is going to be key to today's talk, which is entitled Dual Immune Regulation by the Cation Channel TMEM 176B. It's a fantastic pleasure to have you, Marcello. Thanks for accepting our invitation. And as usually, we like to start our presentations with a short question that is related to career development. And I want to ask you, your experience of staying eight years in France, Hans, how has that influenced you besides scientific training and experience in science? What were the sort of most important personal gains and experience you took out of that period? So thank you so much, Dietmar, for this introduction. And thanks to all the organizers for their kind invitation. I'm very happy to be at this uh, very nice initiative, which is uh, Global Immunotops. Well, you know, uh, the international experience has been uh, critical for my education in, in science. I think that, uh, you know, when you go to other country, you learn other culture, you start to understand that what you call logic is not the same everywhere. And I think that that's very important, you know, for a scientist to, to, to realize that what seems to be true is uh, always, always more complicated. So it was uh, a fantastic, fantastic experience from the professional and life uh, point of view. Uh, and I think it's it's a, a, a critical issue in, in education of every scientist. Um, and I think that uh, you know, for many scientists who, who go from from developing countries to Europe or the United States, I think it's very important when they come back to to keep uh, ambitious. You know, when we go to North our countries, we go to very professional, ambitious labs. And well, uh, when you come back, it's not easy to keep that uh, track. Uh, but I think that nowadays you have international networks, international funding. So there is some way to do and We have very nice examples in Latin America, like, uh, such as Gabriel Rabinovich, uh, Dario Samboni in Brazil, many, many guys who do uh, very nice science in, in South America. So I will share my screen. So I can start, Dietmar? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about our research program uh, aiming at characterizing this cation channel TMEM176B uh, at a physiological and pathophysiological level. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about this capacity of dual immune regulation. And what do I mean by dual immune regulation? So basically, what I'm referring to is a capacity that several immune players have 
to in some scenarios promote effective immune responses and in other scenarios promote regulatory immune responses. And you all know that interferon gamma, IL-2, uh, even type 1 interferons uh, can have this type of behavior, which is obviously very interesting, but is uh, somehow challenging when you try to target these uh, players in a in immunotherapeutic approaches. So first, I want to disclose my conflict of interest with Ardan and, and Roche. And uh, well, this is a, a very old uh, slide from David Moon and Andrew Melior, but I, I think it's very nice because you can see here that uh, immune responses can be uh, either uh, immunogenic or effector responses or regulatory or non-immunogenic. And of course, that in some cases, there is a uh, physiological benefit to have regulatory immune responses. And in other cases, you have a benefit in triggering effect of immune responses. So obviously, it's very important to understand this pathway to manipulate them and trying to uh, transform a pathological situation into a beneficial one. So knowing and understanding immune regulation is critical to continue uh, advancing in, in this field. So uh, we are focused on this uh, guy, TMM176B, which also is known as uh, TORID, uh, which stands for Tolerant, Related, and Induced. So the main message here is these are emergent immunoregulatory cation channels, and TMM176B and TMM176A are members of the transmembrane MS4A family, uh, for which the most known member is CD20. These proteins are highly expressed uh, in the immune system and within leukocytes, you will find them in type 2 uh, CD11B positive conventional dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, in lymphoid cells and gorgama T positive cells. A key issue is that they are associated to immune tolerance. And then in the next slide, I'm going to specify a little bit more this, this concept. And uh, we have shown that these molecules are non-specific monovalent cation channels. So early work from the team of Christina Couturi in Nantes University in Cermes in France showed that this uh, molecule TORID was uh, overexpressed and associated in tolerated allografts. And here you are, they are comparing that to rejected allografts and syngenic ones. And you can see uh, a high expression of this molecule in, in these tolerated grafts. Uh, this molecule is mostly expressed by myeloid, by the myeloid compartment. And interestingly, when you work either with human dendritic cells, but this is also true with rat and mouse dendritic cells, if you mature these cells, this uh, molecule is downregulated, showing that uh, TORID, TMM176B, is associated to immune tolerance and also to the immature state of dendritic cells. So at that time, during my postdoc uh, and, and PhD thesis of uh, Mercedes Segovia, we wanted to understand uh, which was the function of this molecule in dendritic cells. So we determined that uh, it was localized within dendritic cells in the endophagocytic compartment. So as you know, uh, endos uh, endosomes internalize material exogenous antigens uh, into the dendritic cell. Uh, and these antigens can be processed and loaded onto the class two molecules to stimulate CD4 positive T cells. On the other side, you have endogenous antigens, which through the partition pathway are then transported by TAP to the endoplasmic reticulum. And there they are loaded onto class one molecules, to, uh, which then in the surface will stimulate CD8 uh, plus um, cell responses. But you know, in tumoral immunity and in viral immunity, it's very important the so known as cross presentation pathway defined as the representation pathway where exogenous antigens are presented on class one molecules. So uh, these exogenous antigens are internalized in these endosomes and phagosomes, and, they're, and then they're, they're, they are exported to the cytosol and finally loaded onto class one uh, molecules. So at that time, we speculated that TORID could be uh, a player in the cross-presentation pathway. So, so we perform a co-culture with uh, dendritic cells from wild type and TORID knockouts. Uh, and we co-culture these cells uh, with uh, OT1, over specific T cells, and treated the dendritic cells with OVA protein. As you can see here, for soluble OVA and for OVA coated to beads, uh, we have uh, less uh, stimulation of uh, specific C80 cells in the TORID knockouts compared to the wild types, 
showing somehow that these uh, dendritic cells have some defect in, in the cross-presentation pathway. However, if we treated the cells with a minimal OVA peptide, the peptide which is uh, directly recognized by OT1 cells, we observe no difference at all, strongly suggesting that uh, the Tori knockouts have some problem in the processing of antigens through the cross-presentation pathway. And since we were suspecting that this was a, a, an ion channel, we went to, in collaboration with uh, Sebastian Amigorena in, in Institut Curie in, in Paris, we uh, measured phagosomal pH and we observed a, a striking uh, alteration in phagosomal pH where the uh, Tori knockout dendritic cell had an alkalinized uh, phagosomal pH as compared to wild type dendritic cells. So this was very interesting because this uh, somehow could explain the, 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 the defects that we were observing in the cross presentation pathway. So then we wanted to directly demonstrate that uh, TMEM or TORID was indeed an, an ion channel. So we collaborated with Pierre Charnet in Montpellier in France, and we worked with uh, Xenopus oocytes, and we injected these uh, oocytes with a TORID coding uh, messenger RNA. Uh, and we observed that if we acidify the extracellular milieu, then we could observe a strong inward current uh, associated to uh, TORID expression. Uh, if we substitute sodium ions with the impermeable molecule NMDG, we observed that the conductance was almost completely blocked. So in that paper, together with other research, we concluded that uh, the acidifying activity of vacuolar TPAs was triggering TMEM176B transport of ion channels, and that this was important for, to, to, to control phagosomal pH uh, in dendritic cells. Well, uh, we have these consequences in the lumen of uh, phagosomes. We then we wonder where, what will happen in the cytosol. You know, which are the consequences of ion transport mediated by uh, by torrid in, in the cytosol? And as you know, one of the processes that is strongly uh, regulated by ions in the cytosol is inflammasome activation. We know that uh, increased calcium in the cytosol, uh, together with decrease a potassium and chloride anion are strong triggers of NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So we speculated that through this uh, ion handling, uh, TORID could regulate uh, inflammasome activation. So to study this hypothesis, we injected wild type TORID knockouts and double knockouts TORID and caspase, caspase 1 mice with ATP, which is a known NLRP3 uh, stimuli. And then we uh, analyze neutrophil recruitment into the peritoneum. Uh, and what we observe is that in the wild type mice we, with ATP, we were able to induce recruitment of neutrophils. And this was strongly uh, enhanced in the torrid knockout mice. And uh, when we analyzed the double knockouts, uh, torrid and uh, inflammasome, then this uh, recruitment was uh, com almost completely blocked. So here we have the quantification for different animals. So we were showing here in vivo that taurine could be able to regulate uh, inflammasome activation. Then we moved to in vitro studies working with dendritic cells. We treated wild type and uh, taurine knockout dendritic cells with NLRP3 stimuli such as nigerisin and, and ITP. And globally we observed that for both the stimuli we had increased uh, IL-1 beta uh, cleavage and caspase-1 cleavage uh, in the Tori knockouts compared to the wild type. Uh, this was also true when we analyzed IL-1 beta secretion in the culture supernatant at different doses of ATP and nigerisin. Uh, always the uh, knockout dendritic cells secreted higher amounts of IL-1 beta. Um, then uh, we also studied that uh, in the double knockouts in, 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 in Tori caspase 1, this was uh, completely abolished, showing that this secretion was dependent on caspase 1. And this was also true for the other uh, inflammasome related cytokine, IL 18. We had increased IL 18 secretion in, in torrid knockout, and this was uh, uh, not, we couldn't detect the cytokine in the double knockout torrid and caspase 1. So then we wanted to. Uh, a little problem here. Okay, so we wanted to know 
which would be the mechanisms by which a toric could control inflammasome activation. And sometime earlier, we have been working with these calcium activated potassium channels. I previously said that calcium and potassium are very important to control inflammasome activation. And we were studying these potassium channels that were uh, controlled by uh, cytosolic levels of calcium. So here we are uh, working with THP1 human macrophages and we are measuring IL-1B time in the cultural supernatant. So here we are uh, treating the cells with an activator of these channels and we trigger IL-1 beta secretion. Then we, uh, if we treat the cell with ATP, we can trigger IL-1 beta secretion. And this, this, this is almost completely controlled with a known uh, blocker of this channel, which is hyperiotoxin. And in that paper, we also showed that hydroxychloroquine is an inhibitor of this channel and in a dose dependent manner, uh, hydroxychloroquine could control IL-1 beta secretion uh, in these uh, human macrophages. So then we came back to uh, the, the wild type and torrid knockout dendritic cells. Uh, here, so uh, we loaded uh, wild type and torrid knockout dendritic cells with the calcium sensitive probe FURA2 uh, and we worked with very low doses of ATP. At these doses, we observe no increase in cytosolic calcium for the wild type dendritic cells, whereas in the torrid knockouts, we observe a nice increase in cytosolic calcium. And this calcium seems to be important for inflammasome activation because if we treat these cells with the intracellular chelator BAPTA, as expected, we completely blocked IL-1 beta secretion by wild type cells, but this was also true for uh, the toric knockout dendritic cells. And a similar observation was done with potassium. Here we are uh, treating the cell with a high uh, concentration, a buffer con containing a high concentration of, of potassium. Uh, so here we are impairing efflux of this uh, cation from the cells. So again, the result was that we were completely blocking uh, IL-1 beta secretion by both uh, wild type and toric knockout cells. And then we came with this uh, blocker of calcium activated potassium channel, iberiotoxin, as well as uh, hydroxychloroquine. And here we observed that uh, toric knockout and dendritic cells were strongly inhibiting, inhibited in their capacity to secrete IL-1 beta uh, when we treated the cells with these uh, blockers. So, uh, so far we have shown that uh, Torrid controls inflammasome activation in vivo. It does so in vitro, and it seems to be mediated through ionic mechanisms. Uh, so then we speculated, well, what could be at a physiological level the consequences of, of this uh, regulation of inflammasomes? And we thought that the NICE model would be tumor immunology. Uh, because as you know, uh, immune checkpoint blockers can trigger strong immune responses but this is uh, associated with uh, inflamed or hot tissues. You know, if you treat uh, experimental models or patients and uh, tumors are infiltrated by T cells, then you have a high uh, chance to, to, to have a strong anti-tumoral immune responses. However, in other case, cases, you can have no infiltration at all. So these are the so-called immune desert uh, tumors or uh, T cells can be at the periphery of the tumor. In these two cases, uh, uh, tumors uh, do not respond to immune checkpoint blockers. So uh, there is uh, much research trying to uh, trigger inflammation and trying to uh, in induce infiltration of tumor by T cells to improve the antitumoral efficacy of immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, and there are some pathways that are known uh, within the inflammatory responses. Uh, I want to highlight this one because there is a very, this is a very nice uh, paper showing uh, this axis where type one conventional dendritic cells uh, secreting IL-12 and, and then inducing interferon gamma uh, secretion by T cells is an important pathway uh, in anti-PD-1 therapy. So this is known, but we wonder whether uh, there could be potential alternative pathways, uh, probably including two dendritic cells, which are more related to inflammasoma and IL-1 beta secretion. And at the same time, inflammasomes are known to trigger strong TH17 responses. And we wonder whether this pathway could also uh, could be manipulated to improve uh, immune checkpoint therapy. So uh, first, we st started to study uh, expression in human cancer. So here we studied uh, slides from uh, colorectal cancer uh, patients. 
uh, um, we perform the staining and we observe two kinds of staining uh, at the parenchyma and at the stroma. And within each category, we observe that some patients have low expression and others have high expression. Uh, when we analyze expression in the parenchyma, we observe no differences in overall survival when we analyze low or high uh, toroid expression. Uh, however, when we analyze stromal expression, uh, strong uh, expression of uh, toroid was associated with poor overall survival in, in colorectal cancer patients, suggesting that somehow toroid could play a pro-tumoral role. But we wanted to, to, to understand more on, on this, uh, on the potential role for inflammasome in cancer immunotherapy. So then we analyzed um, patients, melanoma patients that were uh, treated with uh, immune checkpoint blockers. And we analyzed uh, expression of inflammasome related genes. And as you can see here, we observed that several inflammasome related genes were overexpressed in responder patients compared to progressive ones suggesting that uh, inflammasomes could play a role in antitumoral immunity triggered by uh, immune checkpoint blockers. And then we performed a very simple experiment, but at the time it was not reported in, in the literature. We said, well, let's do immune checkpoint therapy in inflammasome knockout mice. And what we observed is that uh, both for anti-CTLA-4 and anti-P1 antibodies, uh, the antitumoral effect was uh, poor in the inflammasome knockout mice, uh, showing that uh, inflammasome could be playing a role in immunity, in tumor immunity triggered by immune checkpoint blockers. So we reasoned that it could be interesting to manipulate inflammasome and trying to improve uh, the anti-tumoral efficacy of these uh, approaches. So then we found that this guy, Bay K, uh, is uh, in in vitro studies, we found that this is a strong uh, toroid inhibitor. Um, so we uh, first uh, injected uh, through uh, IP uh, mice, tumor bearing mice, and we observed that there was uh, an antitumoral effect of this uh, compound. Uh, and according to, uh, to our mechanism, the, the, the mechanism of action that we were proposing, we observed that this effect was completely blocked in inflammasome knockout mice. So BK uh, controls tumor progression, and this seems to depend on, on inflammasome activation. And at the same time, this seems to be a non-target effect because we do not have a significant effect in the tori knockout mice, uh, showing that you need uh, tori in the mice to have an antitumoral effect with, the, with this compound, arguing for an uh, on-target effect. Uh, in these mice, we had a strong uh, infiltration in the tumors by CD8 cells. So we wanted to uh, know whether these CD8 cells were important. So we depleted the CD8 compartment here in the green line, and we observed that uh, we lost completely the antitumoral efficacy of the compound, showing that CD8 cells were also involved. And then we uh, combined uh, the compound with PD-1 uh, antibodies, and we did experiments also with anti ctl 4 and we had similar results. And in this melanoma mouse, in, 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 in melanoma model in, in mice, we observed that the compound by K could significantly improve the antitumoral efficacy of uh, anti-PD-1 therapy. So we were improving uh, immune checkpoint blockers by unleashing inflammasome activation. So we continue working on this, and, and we have now some experiments that suggest a physical interaction between the compound and our target. So here uh, we have in gray, in, in green, sorry, uh, the compound, and we have in red the, the cation channel. And in a first uh, attempt, we observed that there was a co-localization, suggesting that this uh, compound could physically interact with uh, the target. And then we perform co-immunoprecipitation studies using uh, biotinylated by K, and we uh, were able to co-immunoprecipitate uh, TMEM with uh, the by K, uh, suggesting a physical interaction with, in between these two players. We are now doing uh, a collaborative study with Ana Alicia Scott in Nacio General and Angelo uh, in, in, in a regional project 
uh, with uh, these labs from Brazil and Argentina, and we are doing docking studies trying to understand where this uh, uh, compound could be uh, binding to, to, to the target. And for us, this is very important to continue understanding how this channel could work at the molecular level and also to uh, improve uh, and, and generate new generations of this compound, trying to improve its anti-tumoral efficacy. Uh, so to sum up this part here, we have this funny illustration where, you know, uh, inflammasomes here are helping the T lymphocytes in the context of anti pd one therapy to go and kill uh, malignant cells. Uh, Torrid is inhibiting inflammasome activation and is somehow uh, blocking these uh, anti-tumoral immune responses, but we can come with this compound BK uh, inhibitory and, and through this strategy unleash inflammasome activation and improve the uh, anti-tumoral efficacy of PD-1 blockers. Um, so we continue trying to understand this uh, mechanism uh, of, of BK and, and, and related to inflammasome activation and torrid, and we are pretty focused on TH17. So these are data from melanoma patients treated with PD-1 blockers, and we observe that TH17, such as IL-17A or, or, or the receptor, are, uh, its expression is associated with a clinical outcome in, in these patients. So the expression of these molecules is, is increased in responders versus progress of patients. If we analyze uh, a potential correlation between this, uh, the IL-17 receptor and inflammasome molecules, we observe a nice uh, positive correlation, suggesting that in humans, uh, in melanoma patients being treated with uh, immune checkpoint blockers, these pathways, inflammasome activation and TH17 could, uh, could be related. Uh, we also analyzed a TH17 signature and this was found to be increased in responder patients uh, during the treatment as compared to the pre-treatment -pre stage. And this signature was also significantly increased in responder versus progressive uh, non-responder patients. So we think that uh, this uh, axis, inflammasome TH17, could be important in, in cancer immunotherapy. So then we came back to uh, mouse models. We treated, uh, again, the, the, the mice with the compound by K together with anti-PD-1, and we compare this to anti-PD-1 alone, and we observe uh, in the tumor an increase in uh, TH17 cells, and if we analyze effector, you know that TH17 cells are very heterogeneous, you have uh, effector subsets and regulatory subsets, if we analyze effector subset here, we observe an increase when we unleash inflammasome with BK, and the opposite seems to happen uh, in the regulatory subset uh, with the BK when we add this compound to the anti-PD-1 therapy. Um, and then we performed the experiments in IL-17 knockout mice. So we treated these mice, uh, wild-type mice here in white, only with anti-PD-1. And then we can improve the anti-PD-1 efficacy if we uh, co-treat these animals with BK here in black. But if we perform this double treatment in IL-17 knockout mice, we completely lost efficacy of the compound, uh, strongly suggesting that uh, IL-17 is somehow involved in the immunological mechanisms triggered by unleashing inflammasome activation. Um, but what will be the role for TH17 in, in anti-PD-1 therapy? So to add direct uh, evidence, here we perform adopted transfer experiments with TH17 cells, and by uh, transferring these effector cells, we could improve the anti-tumor efficacy of anti-P1. And we also observe here that uh, caspase-1 uh, knockout mice respond uh, less well to anti-P1 as compared to uh, wild-type mice here in, in the black line. But if in the blue dash line, we treat these cells, this antitumoral efficacy of anti-P1 in caspase-1, somehow linking TH17 to, to caspase-1, and we think that this is supporting our hypothesis where inflammasome is upstream uh, TH17 in this uh, tumor, anti-tumoral pathways. And we also know that if we form adoptive cell transfer of TH17, we increase in vivo uh, cytotoxic capacity of CD80 cells uh, against uh, tumoral antigens. So uh, taking into account this role for CD80 cells, we know that uh, in, in anti-PD-1 therapy, modulating exhausted T cells is a very important mechanism of action. And uh, Dieter and, and colleagues have 
shown uh, that these exhausted T cells can have different uh, subsets. You can have uh, uh, progenitor exhausted T cells which respond to PD1 blockade and will be expanded. And then uh, you have uh, other subsets of exhausted T cells which express Ransign B and can, ha can have, although they are exhausted T cells, they can have the capacity to kill malignant cells. So uh, we know that this cell uh, exhaustion is a distance cell lineage that arises uh, during uh, chronic infection and cancer in mice and humans. They are defined by a progressive loss of effector function and proliferative potential. Uh, we know that they are also characterized by high expression of inhibitory receptors such as PD-1, LAC3, CTLA-4, and they are also characterized by a particular metabolic, transcriptomic, and, epi and epigenetic problem. Um, but as I said before, the situation here is really complex because you have different subsets of these exhausted T cells. You have these stem-like cells, uh, progenitor exhausted T cells, which respond to anti-P1 that have the capacity to autorenolate and to differentiate into the so-called transitory cells. So these cells are rancing uh, B high, and these cells have some capacity to kill malignant cells. And then you have the terminally exhausted T cells defined by uh, CD101, high levels of TIM3 and, and PD1. Um, so uh, then we analyze these exhausted T cell subsets in our model, com comparing uh, anti-PD1 alone versus anti-PD1 plus BK. And we observe in two different models. Here I'm showing uh, in the lymphoma model, but also we have similar results in melanoma model, that when you unleash inflammasomes with BK, you are uh, increasing the percentage of progenitor exhausted T cells, as well as transitory exhausted T cells, which are associated this subset with responses to anti-P1 therapy uh, at the tumor microenvironment. So uh, this uh, modulation of exhausted T cell subsets could be one of the mechanisms of action by which uh, BK is triggering tumoral immunity. And we also analyze Gransign B in transitory and in terminal exhausted T cells. We observe that in wild type mice, we have increased Gransign B when we add the BK treatment, and this uh, does not happen in the in, in IL-17 knockout mice. And this is true for transitory and terminally exhausted T cells. So again, we are somehow linking inflammasome activation, IL-17, uh, TH-17 cytokines, and uh, modulation of exhausted T cell subsets in this uh, context. Um, so, yes. There was a question? Can you hear me? We can hear you well, but I did not hear a question. No, no, I, I was wondering whether you asked a question. No, no, I did not ask a question, sorry. Okay, okay, so, okay. So we wanted to add evidence supporting our role for T17 in modulating um, exhausted T cells. So here we are adoptively transferring TH17 cells, and we went to the tumor microenvironment to study a subsets of exhausted T cells. And we can see here that adoptive transfer of TH17 increased the number of uh, progenitor exhausted T cells. Uh, which is, uh, is, seems to be in accord to, to, to the uh, improved anti-tumoral efficacy of anti-PD-1 when we transfer uh, TH17 cells. So what we are trying to demonstrate here is that by unleashing inflammasome activation, we can trigger cooperation of TH17 with exhausted T cells. And we think that this is happening uh, because we are targeting conventional type 2 dendritic cells with the compound. We are inhibiting taurid, leading to increased uh, IL-1 beta secretion. And this IL-1 beta uh, will be important to induce differentiation of TH17 into effector cells. And we have in vitro tests where we can see that IL-17 and IL-21 have the capacity to modulate subsets of exhausted T cells. Um, uh, we also know that Torrid is expressed within the TH17 compartment, so we are also studying whether intrinsic expression of the channel in TH17 cells could also be responsible for these anti-tumoral effects. Uh, so we also we are also interested in, in, in trying to understand at the molecular level how this channel can work. 
So this is a, public, a paper published last year by a Brazilian group from Alessandra Contillo, where they found a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, at the 134 position in, in Torrid. And they found that this uh, genetic variant was associated with uh, a better overall survival in, in colorectal cancer patients. And at the same time, they observed that in, in, in dendritic cells and monocytes from these uh, from patients carrying this mutation, there was increased IL-1 beta secretion in vitro. So uh, we thought that these were interesting data that will uh, support our, our hypothesis. So we speculated that this uh, mutation could be a loss of function. So we generated the mutants and we went to uh, analyze this hypothesis. So here the gray bars are controls and here we are studying in vitro the toric activity. And we observe that if we transfect cells with the wild type protein, we have increased toric activity. And this was completely blocked when we uh, worked with the A134T uh, mutant. Uh, and here we have some functional data. Here we are working uh, with human uh, THP1 monocytes. If we overexpress the envelope protein from SARS-CoV-2, we have increased uh, inflammasome activation. We can inhibit that activation with wild type torrid, but the mutant torrid failed to control inflammasome activation, supporting again uh, that this uh, uh, mutation could be a loss of function. So now we are trying to understand at the molecular level uh, how this channel will work to, to handle ions. So we know uh, working in alpha fold models that the mutation is at this level. Uh, and, and we are working on the hypothesis that a phenylalanine here could be somehow a gate for, for the channel and that this uh, mutation could uh, provoke a change in, in, in the angle of the alpha helix and could impact at, at, at this level in, in, in the potential gate. So here we are again measuring uh, torrid activity. We know that we can block it with uh, the inhibitor, BK. And if we perform a mutant uh, uh, changing this uh, conserved phenylalanine into an alanine, we have increased conductance by the channel, uh, supporting that this amino acid could work uh, as a gate. And we lost the capacity to block uh, the, the inhibition with BK uh, in this uh, mutant. So we continue working on this issue, trying to understand uh, how to improve uh, inhibitors and how to understand the, 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 the molecular mechanism of ion handling by the channel. Uh, well, and during the pandemic, we thought that this mechanism of uh, controlling T-cell exhaustion uh, through inflammasome could be also relevant in COVID-19. And why? Because we knew very early in the pandemic that low T cell responses were associated with disease severity. Uh, but we didn't know at, 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 at the moment where we performed this work whether there could be a mechanistic link between T cell dysfunction and hyperinflammation, uh, mostly in severe COVID 19. Um, if these mechanisms are true, this will open the possibility to pharmacologically reinforce T cell responses in therapeutic protocols. So our, our hypothesis was that. Uh, torrid and leash inflammasome activation may lead to T cell dysfunction in critical beta coronavirus disease. So first, we analyzed in COVID 19 patients from bronchiolar lavages. We analyzed uh, torrid and inflammasome related genes expression. And as you can see here, in severe patients, there was a nice down regulation of torrid and the homologous protein uh, TMM176A. And the opposite seemed to happen with the uh, inflammasome related molecules such as IL1 beta and NLRP3. So uh, there is an association with severity between expression of inflammasome and, and on the other way around with low expression of, of torrid in, in severe patients. And then we want to study uh, peripheral monocytes and we determine by Western blood torrid expression. Uh, and we try to correlate it with caspase one activation in plasma. And we observe no significant correlation in non-critical patients. However, in critical patients, we observe a negative correlation between uh, torrid expression in monocytes and active caspase one in plasma, suggesting that in, in COVID-19 patients, torrid could be inhibiting uh, inflammasome activation. Uh, we, then we worked uh, in vitro with human THP1 monocytes 
so first we transfected these cells with uh, the envelope protein from SARS-CoV-2 and by transfecting the cells with this protein we trigger IL-1 beta secretion and when we co-transfected co these cells with E protein plus a taurid, we inhibited uh, inflammation activation triggered by E protein, showing that uh, this cation channel has the capacity to control inflammation activation triggered by uh, a viral protein. Then we move to a mice model. A mouse. Uh, we work with a mouse coronavirus, which is uh, also a beta coronavirus uh, model, which is the murine hepatitis virus. So first we infected wild type and torrid knockout mice with this virus, and we observed that the torrid knockout mice rapidly succumbed to uh, infection by this virus. Uh, and this um, death of, of the torrid knockout mice was associated with increased inflammation activation uh, in these mice. And as you can see here, we have in black the torrid knockout mice, but if we block IL-1 beta in, in the green line here, uh, we improve the survival and a similar result was obtained with in the green line when we studied the double knockout torrid and caspase one. And when we analyze the coronavirus uh, viral load uh, and, and we observed that it was increasing the torrid knockout mice and this was controlled when we blocked IL-1 beta and a similar result was obtained with the double knockout uh, team M and, and, and caspase one. And then we analyzed uh, CD8 T cell responses, and we observed that in association with this bad outcome in, in torrid knockout mice, we have a very low uh, in vivo uh, cytotoxicity against viral antigens in the torrid knockout mice, and this could be recovered when we deleted uh, caspase one. When we went to analyze uh, progenitor exhausted uh, CD8 T cells, they were significantly increasing the torrid knockout mice, and then it came, came down with the double knockout mass. So these results uh, motivated us to try to uh, inject anti-PD-1 at a potential therapeutics in, in, in coronavirus disease. So when we injected anti-PD-1 in uh, wild-type mice, we observed no significant differences in the, in the survival. However, when we studied the torrid knockout mice, there was a significantly improving survival when we treated these mice with anti-PD-1. We also performed in vitro tests with uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from uh, critical COVID-19 patients, and we observed that anti-PD-1 antibodies uh, could restore functionality of uh, these cells in terms of interferon gamma and TNF alpha secretion uh, when we blocked IL-1 beta, uh, sorry, uh, PD-1 in in vitro. So this is the, the other conclusion for the coronavirus story. So here, inflammasome are the, uh, is, is the bad guy. So here they are uh, fighting against uh, lymphocytes with anti-PD-1. And in this case, Torrid may be an ally uh, by inhibiting inflammasome activation, you could uh, uh, prevent uh, exhaustion of CD8 T cells. So uh, this seems to be a quite ambiguous uh, story because in cancer, we are showing that inflammasomes lead to increased CD8 T cell responses, whereas in the coronavirus setting, inflammasomes lead to T cell exhaustion and decreased CD8 T cell responses. So we are still studying these mechanisms, but we think that the capacity in the different models of inflammasome to modulate different subsets of exhausted T cells may be one of the explanations why we have so different outcomes in both models um, inflammasome regulating CD8 T cell responses. Um, and there is, concerning uh, TORI, there is another duality. As I said uh, in, in, in my previous slides, we know that through ionic mechanisms, TORI can control inflammasome activation, so having somehow an anti-inflammatory role. But as I said at the beginning of the presentation, TORI can also promote processing of antigens through the cross-presentation uh, pathway to be loaded on class one molecules. So on one side, a torrid could play an anti-inflammatory role, and on the other side, torrid could play a role in, in triggering adaptive immune responses. So this seems to be quite contradictory, but we thought that, that this was a nice opportunity. And we thought that uh, if we uh, encapsulated uh, the compound in, in nanoparticles, we can avoid blockade of cross-presentation, and I will show you uh, why 
we, we, we proposed this, this hypothesis. So first, we generated the nanoparticles that were internalized in dendritic cells, and they were uh, co-localized with uh, toilet positive uh, endosomes, so showing that these uh, nanoparticles were in contact, in potential contact with the, the, the protein. So uh, we speculated that uh, the free compound could inhibit antigen cross-presentation. We are studying here activation of CD8 cells, the cell line B3Z. Uh, and you can see that if we give the free compound, we can inhibit cross-presentation here. But if the compound is encapsulated in nanoparticles, we are preventing uh, inhibition of cross-presentation. Uh, however, we, uh, in, with the compound encapsulated in nanoparticles, we were still able to trigger IL-1 beta secretion in wild type, but not in torrid knockout dendritic cells. So uh, we thought that this could be uh, a formulating approach to improve the antitumoral efficacy of uh, the compound. Uh, so we worked with melanoma and lymphoma models. And in, in the previous result, when I showed you the results with the, with the, with the compound, we were doing a preventing, a preventing protocol. So here, we are doing a therapeutic protocol with established tumors, and we were able to see that uh, nanoparticles containing the compound could uh, improve the survival of the mice compared to the empty nanoparticles. Uh, however, this, was, this didn't work in torrid knockout mice, suggesting that this was uh, a non-target effect, and the free compound in this therapeutic protocol was not effective at all, showing that this uh, formulation in, 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 in nanoparticles could, could improve the antitumoral efficacy. And we think that this is related to the capacity to avoid inhibition of crop presentation because these uh, tumors are also, also hugely infiltrated by CD80 cells. So what we are trying to demonstrate here is that formulating the uh, solid blocker in ketosan nanoparticles and couples its paradoxical roles in innate and adaptive antitumoral immunity. So when you give the free compound, you are triggering inflammasome activation, but at the same time, you are inhibiting antigen cross-presentation. However, if you administrate the compound in nanoparticles, these nanoparticles are, are known to release uh, compounds in a very slow kinetic, so, uh, and we know that the first 30 minutes are critical to uh, achieve cross-presentation pathway. So what we think that is happening here is that when we give the compound in the nanoparticle, uh, the compound is not released during the critical time window for cross-presentation, and then you can have at the same time inflammasome activation and antigen cross-presentation. So uh, I'm not uh, showing you today uh, other projects of the lab because for, for, for the sake of time, uh, we have talked mainly on cancer immunotherapy and the results on SARS-CoV-2, but we are also collaborating with Albert Rabinovich in, in trying to understand how GAL-1 uh, could form a physiological role with TORID uh, in, in different models. We are also collaborating with Carlos Escande in the Institute with uh, obesity models and with Carlos uh, Batiani uh, in transplantation models and Marcel Segovia in the lab is mostly um, leading uh, with Daniel Oliveira these uh, uh, autoimmunity models in the lab. So these are all uh, projects that are uh, ongoing. So finally, uh, I want to thank uh, the funding agency uh, and the people from the lab, uh, Mercedes Segovia and Sofia Russo, who did the, uh, who were leading the, the work in, in the cancer immunotherapy models. Daniela Oliveira in the SARS-CoV-2 with a former postdoc, uh, Maite Dualde, and well, and the collab our collaborators in the region, uh, Gabriel Rabinovich in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, uh, Annalisa Scott, and Angelo Magro and Ignacio General in Argentina, and in France, uh, where all this story started uh, with Ignacio Negon and Cristina Couture. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Marcelo, for this really spectacular and very inspiring talk. Um, I'm quite sure that there is many questions, but as you all know, I have to refer you to our Twitter account where you can ask uh, all the questions to Marcelo directly, and I encourage everybody to very actively uh, interact there with Marcelo. And with this, I'd like to finish our today's session. I thank you all for joining, and I hope we will see each other uh, next week during our uh, next Global Immunotalks. Thank you very much and have all the nice day. Thank you. Goodbye. See you.